<laughs> Sorry, kids. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And now, I'd like to enter, here's Melopelia. Um, here's his bio. Again, you just click that on, you'll see his bio. And Mel's generously uh, shared some of the articles that I think uh, is worthy of, of also studying that you guys would be able to read. And um, I met Mel personally back in the 70s. Um, it's hard for you to believe, but at one time, I used to be a, you know, a rock and roll star. And uh, we had this performing arts group that performed uh, in Vallejo. It was, a, it was a play called Across Oceans of Dreams. And Mel was involved with the community in Vallejo and they housed our, our, our theater group. And that's how I first met Mel. Uh, we kept in touch. Um, I've, seen, I've seen Mel personally you know, evolve into a tremendous, tremendous educator, a uh, tremendous asset as far as Fonz is concerned. Uh, he was our past national president. I feel very, very honored and privileged and really thankful for Mel to take the time out to be with us tonight. And so without further ado, Mel Orpelia. Go ahead, Thank Mel. You, Thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah, I feel, I feel truly honored to be able to do this in, in front of a virtual audience. I'm used to doing this in front of um, real crowds. And, um, but this is such a, a great audience to have people from the Philippines and all over the country and, and new friends and old friends. Um, it's just my honor. I want to thank you and Ray and, and, and Edwina and Tracy for pulling together such a great group today. Um, and this is my second Phil Filipino American History Month presentation this month already. It's only the fifth. Um, can you guys hear me? You guys hear me okay? All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I just want to um, go into a little bit about um, why I did this presentation and why it's called No History, No Self. Uh, like Alan said, we met in the 70s. Um, and in the 70s, you know, we didn't have a lot of resources uh, to educate us about being Filipino. So when um, Tim, Tim Cordova brought Alan and the rest of the crew to Vallejo with their play Across Oceans of Dreams, um, little did I know that it would be planting the first seeds of Filipino American history in my heart and in my, in my soul. Um, I was born and raised in Vallejo, and those of you who don't know what Vallejo is, it's um, one of the oldest Filipino communities and cities in the whole country. And I'll explain, I'll explain that a little later. It, it actually even predates Stockton as a center for Filipinos. Um, my father was a mono who arrived in America in 1926 as a 20-year-old, and I'll, I'll go into more of that. But because of restricted covenants and, and, and um, other, other laws, my father was not able to buy a house in any neighborhood, even in Vallejo. So we lived in a redlined neighborhood or segregated neighborhood. Most of my friends and neighbors were African-American and um, they became not only my neighbors and friends for life, but my brothers and, and, and sisters for life. Um, so as a result, growing up in, in Vallejo, especially in a white part, part of town, I really didn't know what, I, what a Filipino was. Yeah, we, we, my parents spoke Ilocano at home and we ate certain kinds of foods. But beyond that, I didn't know um, intellectually what a Filipino was or spiritually what a Filipino was. Um, and so, you know, like a lot of kids in the 70s, we struggled to fit in. And sometimes those struggles led us to um, substances that open our consciousness about who we might be or to other Pinoys or, or other people running around the streets trying to uh, prove our, our, our machismo, um, you know, gangs. And, and so I had, a lot of, I had a lot of challenges growing up in the 70s in Vallejo as a, as a Filipino American. And um, I graduated high school with a 1.2 grade point average. I graduated with a kid on the way um, and really didn't have much of a future. Luckily, um, I had a sister going to community college and she encouraged me to take some classes and I had a great mentor 
who encouraged me to go to a four-year college. And at that four-year college at Sac State, I took a, a, a class called Asian American History and a department called Ethnic Studies. And up to this time, I had never even heard the term Ethnic Studies. And um, in this Asian American Studies class taught by Professor Wayne Maeda, I, I learned about not only Japanese American, Chinese American, um, and Korean American history, but also for the first time in my life, Filipino American history. And it was in that class that I saw photographs that just look, look just like the photographs in the albums we had in our own house. And it was the first time that um, someone put my father's life in perspective or in context, or not just my father, but my uncles, and not just my uncles, but the whole Filipino community in Vallejo, which had been around since the turn of the century. Uh, so from there, I changed my major. Well, actually, I added another major. I was majoring in journalism, which I got a BA in. And then I um, got a second major in ethnic studies because of that. It, it really was my epiphany. And I made it my, my mission in life to um, talk about Filipino American history. It's almost like my gospel. And um, coincidentally enough, in 1991, Fonz had its national conference in Sacramento as I was graduating with my undergrad degree. And I met Uncle Fred and Auntie Dorothy there for the first time. And um, it, again, just reaffirmed everything I was doing. I was just leaving my undergrad degree to go to work on my, my um, graduate degree at San Francisco State, also in ethnic studies. So after I um, finished my graduate studies, I got a job, or during my graduate studies, I got a job at Filipinos for Affirmative Action in the East Bay, um, which was directed by Lillian Galedo at the time. And um, I was placed in a, a continuation school working with boys that were members of Filipino gangs, American born, born gangs and Filipino American, Filipino -American gangs. Um, so um, FOB gangs and ABC gangs. And I wanted to create a program for them that would um, ground them in their culture to make them understand that it didn't matter where they were born or where they were raised, we were all Filipinos by virtue of our shared experience as Filipinos, not only just in the Philippines, but Filipinos in America. And that's when I started the first slideshow, literally a slideshow, and that was in 1991, almost 30 years ago. So I've been doing this for a long time, um, and it's just taken, a, taken a, a, on a life of its own. Um, since then, I've presented at um, colleges and universities and and for um, corporations, for um, cultural sensitivity trainings and cultural competency trainings um, at conferences, and not only to Filipino audience, but, but to also non-Filipino audiences. Uh, right now, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but I really enjoy doing it to non-Filipinos. But when I do it to non-Filipino audiences, I don't call it No History, No Self. I call it Beyond Lumpia and That Bamboo Dance. Basically the same presentation, but delivered just a little bit different. So um, I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation. Um, again, this is my, my, my um, version of Filipino American history, and it's through my lens and through the lens of my, my, my family. So I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Here we go. Let's see. Come on. All right, everybody see that? All right. So Fonz divides Filipino American history into four different waves. The first wave was from 1565 to 1905. By 1565, that's the year that Spain colonized hey. the Philippines and made it one of its many colonies. So it's two major colonies. Hey, hey. Sorry, Mel. It's just an interview. Hey, don't see anything. Sure. You can try that one more time. Do you see my It's black. It's black? Yes. Oh my gosh. It's okay. <laughs> can you see it at all? Yeah, we see a pointer. I see the pointer. You can see the pointer? Oh no. Oh yes. Let's see. Uh, how about now? Yes. Hey. There you go. All right. Okay. Let me start. You can see it now? Yes. All right. First, so. first, first permanent settlement? There we go. Nope. Okay. I went back. Oh, you went back. You see now? It just says uh, first permanent settlement 
Filipino settlements circa 1850s. You see this now? That's all I see is uh, Manila okay, Village. I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to start all over again. Okay. We'll try it. We'll get it. That's we'll all right. It. It's all right. What about now? It says first permanent. There we go. Now you can New Spain, the map, no history, no self. All right. Songs, there we there go. We go. Right. Okay. I'm going to blame it on your technology. Is it? No, it's, it's coast to coast. Right. That's uh, must okay. be West Coast time. There you go. It's that lag time. <laughs> All right, so the first wave, again, Fawns separates Filipino American history in four different waves. Uh, the first wave, 1565 to 1905, because Spain colonized the Philippines in 1565 and made it one of its many colonies. And its other major colony was Mexico on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. So they started a galleon trade called the Manila Acapulco Galleon Trade from 1565, and it lasted until 1815. So the galleons left uh, Manila, Philippines, um, went up to Japan where they caught the Japan Current. If you look at the top, top red line, and that Japan Current was basically a river in the middle of the ocean. And that current took them to Cape Mendocino in Northern California, where after they um, spotted land, they would follow the coast of California down to Acapulco, Mexico, where they would ungo unload the goods like um, spices, um, pottery, jewelry, uh, fruits and vegetables from, from the Philippines, um, but also Filipino slaves. And it was on these galleons that the first Filipinos came that first set foot in the United States. And that first landing was on October 18, 1587, in what's now Morro Bay, California. Also, Filipinos were brought to California, California by Junipero Serra, to help build the Spanish uh, missions here in California. So if you ever go to the Philippines and you see the, the Catholic churches there and the Spanish missions in California, they look very similar. Some of the same artisans were used to build them. And one man that they brought over, Antonio Miranda Rodriguez, who was actually a gunsmith, was one of the 46 founders of the city of Los Angeles. And he's buried in the Santa Barbara Mission Graveyard. Um, Filipinos, because they were slaves, jumped ship to escape their Spanish masters all up and down to California and Mexican coast. So in, in Northern California, we have Filipinos mixed with the Pomo tribe. Here in the Bay Area, they're mixed with the, the Miwok tribe, Central California with the Chumash tribe, and all throughout uh, Mexico mixed with the native Mexicans. After the goods were unloaded in Acapulco, they were carried to Mexico City and then to Veracruz where another galleon was waiting to take the goods back to Mexico or back to Spain. Oops, here, let me do this. Um, on the way back to Spain, the galleons also stopped in Louisiana, which was a major shipping port. And here, Filipinos um, jumped ship and established the first permanent settlements in the 1850s. Um, I know Marina Espina um, wrote that it was in um, 1763, but my good friend and Fonz member, Abe Ignacio, who has a master's in, in um, librarianship, did a further literary search and could not find the evidence that, that proved that it was in 1763. Um, so he asked me and other researchers to change the date to the mid 1850s. And, it, it, and this, this um, picture here shows Manila Village um, in Louisiana in 1890. So this 1850s date is probably pretty close, maybe even 1840s. Um, the Filipinos built their, their villages on stilts above the water, just like they did in the Philippines. And they established the first shrimping industry in the United States. They call themselves Filipino Cajuns or Manila men. And here they are doing the, the shrimp dance. After the shrimp were dried in the sun, they would step on them to knock the shells off before they sold them at market. These Filipino Cajuns fought in the Civil War. They fought on the Confederate side. They called themselves Paisanos. They also fought in the Battle of New Orleans along the French, alongside the French patriot Jean Lafitte in 1815. And today in Louisiana, some of these Filipino Cajuns can trace their families back 18 generations to these original Filipino settlers. Um, in the 1890s, the United States well, the Philippines was still under Spanish rule and they started a, a war of independence. Here in the United States, the United States declared war on Spain, the Spanish-American War in 1898. 
Um, they immediately wanted to bring that war over to the Philippines, so they sent Admiral Dewey in this photo to meet with the Filipino rebel leader, Emilio Aguinaldo. And Dewey told Aguinaldo that if the Filipinos helped the Americans fight the Spanish in the Philippines, America would give the Filipinos the independence that, they, that they'd been fighting for. The Filipinos wanted that in writing, but never got it. But nonetheless, um, the American forces came to the Philippines um, and they actually left from Mare Island Shipyard. So in May of 1898, the US Navy sailed from Mare Island Shipyard in Vallejo, went to the Presidio in San Francisco to pick up the troops, sailed across the Pacific Ocean to Manila Bay and very easily defeated the Spanish Armada. Um, Spain surrenders to the United States and, Ad, and Emilio Aguinaldo declares June 12th as Philippine Independence Day after that victory. So in Kuwait Cavite, he declares himself the first president of the Philippines, raises the first Philippine flag, and declares the Philippines independent from Spain. But even though there were Spanish and American authorities in the audience, they did not acknowledge that declaration. So the American troops stayed in the Philippines at this time. In December of 1898, the United States bought the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and some other uh, Pacific Islands um, for $20 million with the signing of the Treaty of Paris, but only Cuba was given as independence. So if you look at the Cuban flag and the Philippine flag, there are, very, um, there are similarities between the designs on the flag. Um, soon, uh, hostilities between the Filipino forces and the American forces um, um, occurred, and on February 4th, 1899, Willie Grayson shot at some Filipinos and started the Philippine-American War. This is a cartoon from a newspaper that says, Kill Everyone Over 10. It was issued by General Jacob M. Smith. He issued his men to go to the island of Samar and turn it into a howling wilderness and to kill everyone from, from children to, grand, to grandparents. He was court-martialed after the war for his war crimes. Remember, at this time, we didn't have television or um, the internet, so a lot of people got their information through these magazines, and Judge Magazine was one of the more influential magazines at that time. And here's a picture of, of um, President McKinley holding a Philippine baby and washing him in the waters of civilization. In the background, you have uh, Puerto Rico and Cuba who've already been washed, and you can't see it real clear here, but their skin has been lightened because of it. And the Filipino baby looks like an African bush baby. Um, President McKinley was already stating to the American people at this time that the Filipinos were unfit for self-rule, and that was America's duty to civilize, Christianize, and educate the Filipinos. He did this as a way to justify that war in the Philippines. And the American troops that went there came with advanced weaponry like the Gatling gun. The Gatling gun was a machine gun and in long range fighting, they were annihilating the Filipino troops. But unknown, unknown to the, Philippi uh, the Americans, the Filipinos knew Filipino martial arts. So in close range fighting, guerrilla warfare fighting, um, the Filipinos, even though they had these old single shot weapons, were using um, bolos and sticks and knives and surprising the troops and beating them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's why some historians refer to the Philippine-American War as America's first Vietnam. There are also black soldiers fighting in the Philippines, otherwise known as the Buffalo Soldiers. And when these soldiers came to the Philippines, they heard the white soldiers calling the Filipinos names like gooks and niggers. And of course, it reminded them of the racism that they were still experiencing back in America. And because of that, um, over a thousand of these Buffalo soldiers deserted their posts for the first time in US military history and went to help the enemy, us Filipinos. After the war, many of them stayed in the Philippines um, and lived the rest of their lives there or married and brought their wives back to America as some of, them, uh, as some of America's first war brides. According to the U.S., about 250,000 Filipinos were, were killed during this war. Filipinos say that number was more like 2 million because not only, not only were people killed outright in battle, but many of them died from disease and starvation. By 1901, the United States was already trying to rebuild the Philippines in its own image. 
They started a public work system by rebuilding the, the water, electrical, and road systems, an American public health system where they established um, US-based um, nursing schools. That's why so many Filipinos um, are nurses. But more importantly, they established American public school system in the Philippines. And they brought over 600 teachers on the, on the USS Thomas to teach American subjects to children throughout the Philippines. So not only were they learning mathematics and literature, but they were learning the English language and American history, not US history. We call these teachers the Thomasites. But here in America, very few Americans knew what a Filipino looked like and were questioning why, the America, why America was fighting this war thousands of miles away in the Philippines. So they, uh, Congress established a, a um, Philippine village at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair. It was really propaganda. They brought over a thousand Filipino natives to inhabit um, the largest exhibit at that fair. And um, they, they had these Filipinos wearing their G-strings, basically looking like half-naked savages. And they would have them pose with the, with the civilized Americans to show the contrast in um, how uncivilized we were back in the Philippines. Uh, but you got to remember at this time, Manila was a very modern city. They had streetcars, they had American style buildings, but this is what the American government wanted to show the American people to justify that war in the Philippines, to justify that America, um, the Philippines needed America to civilize them. They also um, further showed how uncivilized Filipinos were by having one of the tribes kill cook and eat a dog every day during that fair. So when you hear the stereotype that Filipinos eat dogs, this is where it started. But all you Filipinos know we don't eat dogs, we eat cats. No, I'm just kidding, we don't eat either. Or at least not all the time. <laughs> Here we go. But there were still Filipinos being sent to the, to the United States by the American government in the Philippines. We call them pensionados for the pensionado program. And they went to many universities throughout the United States, including um, universities there in Seattle, Cornell, and the UC, UC Berkeley here in California. And their, their um, charge was to get an American style of education, or what I like to call miseducation, to bring it back to the Philippines to um, help develop the government and educational, educational systems over there. The second, hello? The second wave um, started in 1906. And it started in 1906 um, um, because that's when the first 15 Ilocanos were brought to Hawaii by the Hawaiian Sugarcane Planners Association. And I know some of um, our members, our roots come from Hawaii, like Edwina, and even my family. Um, but those, from those first 15 Ilocanos that work in the plantations, we have had continuous, sustained Filipino immigration to the United States since then, um, coming for economic reasons as well as family reunification purposes. Um, we call them cicadas, they were workers. Most of them were Filipinos or Ilocanos and Visayans and Boholanos, who came because the Philippines and those, those parts of the Philippines, the northern part and some of the Visayas were economically um, very depressed. Around Manila, not so much. That's why you had very few Tagalogs coming at that time. Um, most of those coming were between the ages of 16 and 20, 22 years old. They came by ship. And because the United States um, 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 basically ran the Philippines as a territory or as a colony, Filipinos had an immigration status as American nationals. So they didn't need any special um, passports or visas to come to the United States. Um, we refer to those men who arrived here as the Manongs. And there were a few Manongs as well, but mostly Manongs. And they were uh, some of the sharpest dressers. Um, this is a picture of Maria Martinez Carter. Her husband was George Washington Carter. And he was a Buffalo soldier that fought in the Philippines uh, during the Philippine-American War. After the war ended, he married Maria. They started a pig, far a pig farm in Cavite, but the saltwater crocodiles kept on eating their pigs. So he got a job at Mare Island in Vallejo in 1912 and brought Maria and their first daughter to Vallejo, making them Vallejo's first Filipino family. In 1915, um, they had their, their second daughter 
Alice born in Vallejo. So she was our first Pinay born in Vallejo, uh, half black and half Filipino. And you'll hear, hear these stories um, in San Francisco as well as Seattle. Their first Filipino families were these marriages between Filipinas and Buffalo soldiers. This is my uncle Clemente who um, was recruited by the Hawaiian Sugarcane Planters Association in 1925. But because he spoke good English, he um, was used in the office to act as an interpreter for all the Filipino or all the Ilocano um, cicadas that they were hiring. And because of that, he earned a little bit more money. So he sent that money back to the Philippines to three of his brothers who he um, um, asked them to meet him in San Francisco the next year. So he sent it to my uncle, um, Modesto in this picture, my father, uh, Nazario, who was a 20 year old with a sixth grade education who could read, write and speak English. And then my uncle Leon, who um, settled in, in, um, in Seattle. So those were the three brothers. Those were the three single brothers. There were three more brothers up in the Philippines who were married. So all the single brothers came to America so they could earn money and send it back to their married brothers. But this was pretty typical of all the men coming at that time, um, single, looking for adventure, looking for work. But because of the American public school system in the Philippines, they could speak English. And that pays dividends when they're um, looking for work, especially um, in certain sectors of society. But most of the Filipinos could find only one of four kinds of work. Most of them, especially here on the West Coast, worked as stoop labor in the farms, making a dollar a day or 10 cents an hour very hard work. And here they are using the short hoe. This is probably in the Central Valley um, right before asparagus season. If they didn't work in the fields, they went up to Alaska. Um, we call them the Alaskaros. And here they um, also started unions and they um, did things like work in the canneries and clean the, clean the fish and, and can the fish. And many of some of these young people, well, some of the people on the, on the Zoom call like Alan, worked summers there. I know some of my friends did that even here from California. Third type of job they work were as domestic workers. This is a picture of Lorenzo Dizon. He was a chauffeur for Mary Pickford. Mary P Pickford was a um, top Hollywood movie star in the 1920s and 30s. And he was a chauffeur. Um, a lot of the rich white people, not only um, in Hollywood, but um, um, in society and in business in general, like to have Filipinos because they didn't have to worry about their immigration status and we spoke English. The fourth type of job, which is pretty relevant to the Bay Area, were shipyard workers. In the Bay Area, we had um, Hunters Point in San Francisco, the Kaiser Shipyards in, in Richmond, and in Vallejo, we had Mare Island Naval Shipyard, which was the largest naval shipyard on the West Coast. So in this picture, you can see all these Filipino workers are sitting in a dry dock. Um, this is just one shop. By 1932, my father and two of my uncles were all working at Mare Island. This is my uncle uh, Clemente, which you saw earlier in the slideshow next to that cable car. But the Filipinos that worked at the shipyard were making a good salary. So remember the Filipinos working in the farms were making 10 cents an hour, but these guys were making it upwards of a dollar an hour. Plus it was year round work. They had benefits, they had medical. Um, so the Filipinos who got a job in Vallejo at Mare Island, economically, they were pretty stable. And that, um, that was one of the reasons why the Vallejo Filipino community has, has been so, um, such a, a stable community and has grown the way it has for the last over hundred years. But it was a bachelor society. Uh, for every 20 Filipino men, there was only one Filipino woman. Most of the women thought that their dads, their brothers, their uncles, their brothers, maybe even their boyfriends or husbands would come to America, which they refer to as the mountain of gold, get rich, and then go back to the Philippines where everyone could live happily ever after, not realizing that these men had hard, hard, um, hard work and low pay. This is my dad right here. But one of the first things the men did when they um, arrived in, in America was um, borrow a suit if they didn't have their own suit then go to a professional photo studio and have their photo taken. Then they would send those photos back to the Philippines to reinforce that image that 
everyone who comes to America becomes rich. But these men also needed these suits for when they wanted to go out on the weekends to socialize. But because there were so few places where they could, uh, where they were accepted, they socialized in places like Taxi Dance Hall. So Taxi Dance Hall was a nightclub owned by a white man um, and they had white women um, working there where the Filipino man can buy a ticket for a dime and with that dime ticket he can dance with that white woman for one dance lasting from one to three minutes. Now remember it took him an hour in the hot sun to earn that dime but they were so lonely for their female companionship that they would blow their whole week's paycheck um, at these taxi dance halls just to have the attention of these women. Sometimes um, Filipino men were seen dating white women in 1930s America, like um, Dan or John and Darlene Cantorna in this picture here. And in this picture here, that's my father, but that's not my mother. But if you think about Philip, um, African American history in the 1930s, what would happen if a black man was seen with a white woman in America? He would get lynched, he would get beat up, or, or worse. Um, so those same attitudes were directed towards us Filipino men when they were seen with young white women. And that started the anti-Filipino movement of the late 1920s till um, um, the end of World War II. This is a famous picture that was taken at a hotel in 1929 in downtown Stockton. Um, pretty soon there were government reports that were scapegoating Filipinos. They said Filipinos were viewed as a peril, that we took jobs away from white Americans, that we were an economic burden on America, that we're spreading venereal diseases. But remember what was going on economically in this time in America in the 1930s, the Great Depression. Whenever the economy is bad, uh, the government and society likes to blame the newest immigrants. And at this time it was the Filipinos. Um, this newspaper article says Filipinos threaten in Turlock. Night Riders armed with clubs order hasty exodus. The Night Riders were the Ku Klux Klan and they did terrorize and um, drive Filipinos out of certain towns. And one Filipino by the name of Furman Tabera was shot and killed while he was asleep in his bunkhouse in Watsonville, California after the Watsonville riots in 1930. So all of this um, led to racism, not only amongst the adults, but also towards the children at that time. So this, this group of brownies um, in Vallejo um, were forbidden from joining the white brownie troop because the white brownie leaders didn't want them to be integrated. So they had to form their own white uh, brownie troop. But I'd like to say that the, the white brownies uh, were jealous because these were the original brownies because of the color of our skin. But all of this, um, all of these attitudes towards the Filipinos led to the passage of anti-Filipino laws where Filipinos could, um, after 1932, Filipinos could no longer become U.S. citizens, which meant we could not vote, we could not own property or business or land, we could not live in white residential neighborhoods, we couldn't work most civil service jobs, and they passed anti-miscegenations in 12 states, including California and Virginia, that made it illegal for Filipinos to marry whites. So that ended this um, era. Um, and this is a picture of a wedding reception in Vallejo, Mr. and Mrs. Benoya here in the middle, who had to get married in Seattle, Washington. Then they came back to Vallejo to have their wedding reception. Finally, in 1934, the Tidings McDuffie Act was passed. And that changed the Filipinos' immigration status from American nationals to Asian aliens and with that, they put a quota of 10, uh, 50 Filipinos per year allowed to immigrate to the United States. The third wave started in 1942. And on, on December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor was bombed. Six hours later, Japan invaded the Philippines and thousands of Filipinos here on the mainland and in Hawaii um, wanted to um, join the war effort and free their homeland from the Japanese. Um, for several thousand Filipinos, they, could, uh, they were able to get into the U.S. Army's 1st and 2nd Filipino Infantry Battalions. They were trained at Camp San Luis Obispo here in Central California. And these were the men who were trained to pave the way for MacArthur's return as um, um, in jungle warfare as well as in communications. Um, but the tragedy is when 
they came back to the states to get their war medals, they were given the medal that was one lower than what have been would have been given to a white person. But the vast majority of Filipinos who got into the military um, could only get into the U.S. Navy. This is my father right here. Uh, when my father was working at Mare Island and the war started, he and many of his friends um, joined the U.S. military and were sent immediately to um, the Naval Steward School in San Diego. Um, and like my father, they became stewards or servants to, um, to um, officers in the, in the Navy. My father was stationed in Pearl Harbor and he had to clean the cabins, shine the shoes, um, all the menial jobs that, um, that stewards do. It was only Filipinos and blacks who were rele relegated to these positions almost until 1970. But for these Filipino men, they felt it was a sacrifice in their dignity because they knew that by joining the US military, they would eventually become US citizens and hopefully um, be able to bring wives to America and have better lives for their families. This is a picture of George and Eddie Dizon on Lower Georgia Street in Vallejo. So Lower Georgia Street is infamous. It was the, the, the red light district for sailors on the west coast of, 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 of the United States. And many sailors, including Filipino sailors who joined in the Philippines and were stationed at Mare Island, um, got to go down Georgia Street and partake in the gambling joints, the, um, the, the pool halls, the barber shops, the bars, and everything else that was on that street. This um, woman here, um, Lucy Dizon, who is the sister of Lorenzo Dizon, who you saw earlier, um, was one of the richest women in Solano County, where Vallejo is located. And that's because she owned a number of gambling joints as well as houses of prostitution, believe it or not. And it made her very, very rich. Um, the Filipino Community Center in Vallejo was partially funded by her donations from her, her businesses. Um, her, other, her, um, her other nickname was Diamond Lucy because the rumor was when uh, Manuel Quezon was in, in exile in Los Angeles during World War II, he gave her a diamond ring. Um, when the war ended and the United in the Philippines um, was declared independent on July 4th, um, 1946, she, she um, chartered a plane and put about a dozen of her best friends on that plane to attend the festivities in the Philippines. That's exactly, that's how rich she was. Um, she had a tragic life though. She had a number of bad relationships and marriages and she ended up almost penniless and, and died in a little shack behind the Filipino Community Center in Vallejo that she helped um, buy for the community. Um, this is a picture of a Filipino restaurant, probably about 1946, 1947 in Vallejo. And you can imagine these Filipino sailors coming to this place called Vallejo and finding a Filipino restaurant that had the whole, rest, the whole menu listed on the, front, on the front of the restaurant. In 1946, the United States passed the War Brides Act, and that allowed these Filipino men who served in the US military, either the Navy or the Army, to go back to the Philippines, get married, and bring their wives over to, to the United States. Um, also, at this time, the United States lifted some of those anti-Filipino laws, so now Filipinos could become US citizens. They can own property if they can find someone to sell them to, but they also raised a quota from 50 per year to 100 per year but these war brides did not fall under any of those quotas. So for the first time, you have large numbers of Filipino wives in the United States. And when you have wives, you have children. When you have children, you have families. When you have families, you have the beginning of the Filipino community as we know it today. So these were some of the first baby boomer kids born in Vallejo. And here's a citizenship class in 1947 in Vallejo. Of course, just like today, you had to um, pass a test to, to get your citizenship. And this is um, a, a celebration, Philippine Day at Solano County Fair. The state fair also had Philippine Day. So before the war, the Filipinos were referred to as little brown monkeys, but because we served um, alongside with the United States during World War II, we became little brown brothers. You know, still a little patronizing, but better than little brown monkeys. And we have the proliferation of Filipino organizations after the war, uh, Lejanaros del, del Trabajo, the Gran Oriente, 
Caballeros de Masalang, um, and a host of other Filipino um, organizations. So every community where there was a Filipino, you had a Filipino community of Solano County Inc. or Filipino community of, of Seattle. Um, so this is, these were organizations that provided a lot of support and social outlets for Filipinos during these time periods. The last wave, it's called the fourth wave, in the Philippines, they refer to it as the brain drain because their most educated Filipinos were now leaving the Philippines to come to America. Um, in this picture, you see this happy family um, supposedly landing in America with their whole future ahead of them in this new land of opportunity. But this is actually my family going to the Philippines on vacation in 1967, and that's me right here. But it's just a, a good depiction of a happy Filipino family getting off a plane. Um, so in 1965, the Immigration and Nationality Act was passed, and that changed the immigration quotas from 100 per year to 20,000 per year. 20,000 per year. So this really changed the Filipino communities throughout the country. And more than half of those initially arriving were Filipino nurses. And they were being recruited because there was a medical and a, a nursing shortage here in the United States, primarily due to, to the Vietnam War. And because these Filipino um, women, mostly women, um, got educated in the Philippines at um, nursing schools that were comparable to what the nursing schools were here in the United States, it was very easy then for them to pass their, the state boards and um, get jobs here in America. There were also Filipinos still working in the fields in um, Delano, California. And this group of grape pickers were led by Larry Itliong and Philip Veracruz. And they started a grape strike and boycott in September of 1965. And they convinced uh, Cesar Chavez and the Mexican grape pickers to join them. And they eventually formed the United Farm Workers Union of America. And here's Cesar Chavez, uh, Philip Vera Cruz, Larry Itliong, and Uncle Pete Velasco. And at this time, you start having Filipino businesses. Um, starting up in the United States. This is a picture of a, our only Filipino store in Vallejo in the late 1960s and early 70s. It was about the size of an average classroom, but it had everything from Filipino furniture to rice, sacks of rice to um, dried fish. It was, it was a great little store owned by Luisa G. Evangelista, and she named it the Luisa G. Evangelista store. Um, and like all communities, um, fundraising was done through Queen contests. And this is an interesting picture from my book. This is um, Larry Acera. Larry Acera was a third generation Filipino American born in Vallejo. Um, he was our first elected Filipino to city council in 1973 at the age of 24 years old. And he's crowning a queen here, um, Queen um, Nancy. And um, Larry went on to become um, elected to our board of supervisors and became um, very famous in the solar energy and green technology field. Um, Queen Nancy here also became famous. She became, believe it or not, a porn actress. This is um, my high school graduation photo in 1979. Um, as you can see, there are very few Filipino kids in this photo. Uh, most of the African-American kids came from my neighborhood. And here I am in the front row with some of the few Filipino kids that were in my school. There were about 10 of us. Um, and this is me right here with the long hair and a smoke Hawaiian t-shirt. Um, and the last graduating class at Hogan High School, over 50% of the, of the students graduating were Filipinos. And they have had two Filipino principals since then. Something that I could not have even imagined when I graduated from that school in 1979. Another immigration was, act was signed in 1990 by George Bush, and that allowed these Filipino World War II veterans who were stranded in the Philippines after the Rescission Act was passed in 1946, allowed them to come to America and get their US citizenship. Unfortunately, that's all they got. They did not get any benefits that they were, prom that they were promised, and many of them lived in um, less than ideal situations. And this is a picture of uh, some Filipino World War II veterans that a group of Philam activists here in San Francisco, myself included, rescued from a, unfortunately, another Filipino man who exploited them and used them basically as slave labor. Um, I'm gonna end the show with a few Filipino American 
Filipino American role models. And this is your congressman in Virginia, Bobby Scott. And the first time I met Bobby Scott was at the Virginia Beach um, Fonz conference where he installed me on the board of directors for Fonz. And it turns, and I just ran into him not too long ago because he's one of the best friends of my boss, Congressman Mike Thompson. And I told him the story last time I saw him when he was a guest here in, in Vallejo. Um, this is um, Apple from the Black Eyed Peas. This is Christetta Comerford, the first woman and the first person of color ever to be um, appointed the White House executive chef. This is Natalie Coughlin. She was born and raised in Vallejo. She's the most decorated female US Olympian. She was a, a championship swimmer. Um, this is her Grammy, uh, Grammy Award winning um, musician. I knew her as a little girl, Gabby Wilson. Her mother and I worked um, together at Kaiser Hospital. Um, her father is a good friend of mine who's also a musician, and now this is her today. Um, the first Filipino elect to a, elected to a statewide seat in, the Uni in California, Rob Bonta, out of, out of Alameda. Um, Danny Inosanto, who was a, who is a martial arts legend and a protege of Bruce Lee, and introduced Bruce Lee how to use the nunchucks and the sticks. And Chad Hugo from Your Neck It Was, um, from the Neptunes. And I'm going to end with this slide. And these were my heroes and role models as well, the models. This is my father, Nazario, my uncle Clemente, and my uncle Modesto. This was at my uncle um, Clemente's 92nd birthday party about 20 years ago. Shortly after that, he passed away. Then my uncle Modesto passed away a few years later. And my father passed away in 2007 at the age of 101 years old. But I pay um, respect and honor to these men and to their generation, because these were the men who endured that extreme racism and oppression here in the United States to persevere and build and establish the Filipino community as we know it today, so we can have the freedoms that we have as Americans. So with that, I want to thank you for allowing me to share my No History, No Self slideshow with you today. Thank you, Mel Orpilia. I'll stop the share there and I'll give the screen back to you. So I'm, I'm open for questions. I know we're right at nine o'clock. Like we're a true pro. All right. So I ran <laughs> through it. <laughs> okay, okay, anybody? Alex, I'll moderate the, uh, the, the questions. Uh, can we give him a big virtual round of applause from wherever we are? Was it thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mel, can you leave your um, email address there in the chat so people can get a hold of you? Will and do. since it's a, a Zoom season, he's available to do any kind of presentation you want on Filipino American history and just put it on Fallon's Hampton Roads bill. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Here, go see. As I was kind of monitoring the chat, I know a lot of you guys were looking at it. Um, this is great because we're kind of finding connections here. Max Frias, who is uh, the vice president of Fonz here in Virginia Beach, he, his family actually got um, supplies from Miss Evangelista in, uh, in Vallejo. So that, there was a connection there. I just saw that in the chat as well. And as Mel, and as Mel was doing that presentation, I uh, put up the Google Docs with all the Fonz national events. It's in the chat, so you guys can click on that and you know um, celebrate Fallon History Month throughout October. So um, any questions or comments from Mel? that you guys might have. Feel free to unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat and then we'll kind of uh, moderate it from there. I know it's late on, on the East Coast. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, if uh, for, we'll, we'll leave this thing open for a little bit because uh, in the end I wanted to share a, a video, or not a video, but a, a trailer uh, Put on by Dreamland, and uh, this is—it's been since uh, 1994 since uh, Fonz has been associated with any kind of Filipino American history uh, doc documentary, and I think it's about time that hey, we need to start investing, and it's time for another documentary while while some of us are still around. So uh, I was going to show a trailer there. We're trying to raise funds for that event. But before we even do that, uh, Mel, let me, let me ask you this. Uh, 
as far as uh, Filipino American consciousness for all the young folks, what kind of advice would you give them as far as how to uh, promote the history or advocate for the history? And what do you think the next step would be? Well, I, I think they should take advantage of uh, Filipino American classes if they go to a college that, that teaches them. I think they should take advantage of um, Filipino American teachers like Ray. I think they should take advantage of Filipino clubs like Fonz and like some of the clubs at some of the schools and take advantage of the wealth of, of, of experts within Fonz. Um, but really, I think it starts at home. I think it starts with interviewing your parents, your grandparents, um, the oldest Filipinos you know. Everyone has a story. You have a story, I have a story, your parents have a story. But, you know, like my father, they never thought that their story meant anything to anyone except themselves. So they don't share the stories unless you ask them. And I, you know, I, you know, I wish I would have, um, my father was still alive. Uh, I still have more stories to get from him. And my grandma, my grandma Mary, I, I want to hear stories about her coming through, through Angel Island. I mean, there's still so many stories I think um, are out there that we, we can tell. Um, and then tell stories about the post-65 generation. Tell stories about growing up in, 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 in Hampton Rose, growing up in Stockton, our generation. We've, we've talked about the Monongs, we talked about the bridge generation. We need to talk about the people who grew up in the 60s and 70s, and then the 80s and 90s. You know, we need to tell our stories and, and that will add to the, to the scholarship and to the understanding because, um, you know, we're not getting any younger either. I mean, I mean you don't have any hair. Joni, <laughs> I'm starting to get a little gray. You know? You know, yes. we're, we're not going to be around forever and, and, you know, take advantage of all the people here um, who can tell and share stories. Great. Okay. Well, um, this is Edwina. I just wanted to say thank you for bringing the stories of our, you know, my grandparents in the 19, in the 1920s, because it was, it was a tough time, but it was. Um, you, you bring so much life to them because people forget what it was like for them. So thank you so much for bringing that out. And you know, that generation, they're, they're dinosaurs. You know, when my father passed in, 19, in 2007, there were five other monos left in town in Vallejo. And one by one, they passed away. The last one to pass away was my uncle Pete and Chetta, who was my barber since I was a little kid. And he too passed away at the age of 101 years old. Wow. Um, but you know, what's left now are the war brides, a few war brides. Um, the, or the wives of the mono. So we need to get their stories because they had a unique experience as well. Many of them as young women in their 20s coming to America, married to men who were 30 years older than they were. You know, they, and, and not knowing, not knowing, you know, American society and just being away from their family and their support system. Those are the stories we need to get to before they're all gone. And there's only a handful of them left here in town, like my mother. Um, so we need to get those stories too. Okay. Okay, Mel, thank you. And uh, we're gonna show this uh, clip real here. I think someone's trying to ask a question. Okay, who's gonna ask a question? Well, go ahead. <laughs> Point. Okay. Hey, um, Mel, you had, you had shown there was a, an, image a, of an image of Danny in a santo. Is that how you pronounce yes. his name? I know that there's a big, like, you're, you're I know that there's a Tracy, big, you're echoing. Like, I can barely hear you. What do I do? What do I do? <laughs> let me go to Alan. Oh, let me go to Alan. Sorry, hang on one second. Why don't you mime it? Sorry, hang on one second. Are you guys all in the same room or what? Yes, here? yes, yes. Oh, no it's a party. It's a party over here. They are. They're the office. Office. What are you doing? Go ahead. Is this okay? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah better. Should I wear a mask? Oh, that's better. <laughs> oh, no, don't so, do that. Mel? <laughs> yes. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay. Can you tell us about... Um, Danny in, in Asanto because we have a big FMA 
you know, school here, several of them. And I think, you know, just briefly, if you could share that with others who may not know who he is or. Well, maybe, maybe Joni can do it. Cause um, I can do Danny, it. <laughs> Danny um, came, he, he's a, he's a um, native born Stockton boy and from a very, uh, from a pioneer Stockton family. And he presented at the Smithsonian a few years ago. He's in his eighties, but this man moves like he's in his forties. Go ahead, Joni. You don't know Danny was something? Go ahead, Joni. Go ahead, Joni from the jungle. Uh, background, I'll, I can give his history. Good. You're on. So who is he in the martial arts world? Tell, tell a little bit about his martial arts okay, reputation. So, so um, Danny, Danny was a, he was also an athlete when he was in high school. So he was very athletic. And um, when he went to the army, he learned boxing and he learned um, other styles of martial arts. But Stockton also is home for, for some of the most legendary and the first Filipino martial artists in the country. Um, Angel Cabales and uh, Leo Giron, Max Sarmiento. So he, he also learned from these uncles of his and he um, created, you know, he, he also um, taught Bruce Lee some Filipino martial arts. And today, Danny Inosanto has a, a um, school in Marina del Rey in, in, in LA. And not only him, but his um, students like Jeff Imada have been in the movies, not only acting in movies as, as um, martial arts guys, but also choreographing movies. So um, like the Born Identity series, um, that's all Filipino martial arts choreographed by Jeff Imada, who is Danny Eno Santos um, um, protege. Um, um, Book of Eli with Denzel Washington, the movie 300 with the, with the um, Spartans. Um, but Danny, Danny really was the first Filipino martial artist to write a book about Filipino martial arts. Um, but his legacy really was his relationship with, with Bruce Lee and how he influenced Bruce, Bruce Lee and how Bruce Lee influenced him. Um, but that relationship was so strong that, that Danny is the, the Ninong to Bruce Lee's um, children um, and they consider yeah. each other family. You want to add to that, Joni? Um, yes, I will add to that. Um, Danny Inosanto's parents are Sebastian Inosanto. Um, you described them as part of the Monong generation. They called themselves old timers. Barbara Posadas puts that in her research. And that's like the amic term. And, and then when we say Monongs, we also have to remember the Monongs too, because there were some, even if it was just one out of 14 or one out of 22. Uh, and he's from Aklan, and well, Adjiki, Aklan, um, Sebastian and Osanto. And his wife is the Mary Arca in Osanto of the Arca clan, originally from Hawaii. So Ma Mary, his wife was, um, born in Hawaii, and she is the sister of Flora Arkamata, for whom the school in Stockton is named after. And we think she, that's the first time a public school in the U.S. has been named after a Filipino-American woman. We have to do research on that. You would think that if there was another one, we would know, Fonz would know yeah. in the network. And both of the Inosantos are, um, Sebastian was, um, a labor leader and uh, as well he and Sebastian and Mary were among the founders of the historic Trinity Presbyterian Church in Stockton that housed the farm workers um, during the strike uh, and that Larry Idleong was also a member of that church there's actually a lot of leadership um, that comes out of there so that's some of his family history. Oh, and Danny's daughter is named Diana Lee in Osanto, and the Lee is from Bruce Lee. And so she grew up with uh, Bruce Lee's son, Brandon, I believe is his name, was his name, who yep. died young. And um, Diana's a, also a filmmaker and actress. She was a stunt person, but she learned so much from being on on film that she created her own movie, The Sensei, mm -hmm. uh, that's fabulous. So, and she's on social media, so. Hey, so uh, thank you so much, Joni, for that, uh, that, that uh, 
uh, your words bit. about the history. <laughs> as I'm uh, from the Philippines, as I'm monitoring the chat, there are a couple of questions that are similar. So I hope Mel can ask that really quickly. Um, the, the first, I have a couple of people asking about uh, Filipino uh, tribal tattoos. I know you're very much part of that as well. And also, if someone's asking, what books are you reading now to further inspire Filipino American education? So, what two books am I reading now? Um, you know, I, I can honestly say I'm not reading any Filipino American books right now. I am reading, well, it could be a Filipino American, but I'm reading a book by um, um, Sam Buwat. Sam Buwat um, is a uh, Filipino martial artist out of out of Arizona. He just passed away two weeks ago, but he trained um, with my grandmaster and my grandmaster's father and the founder of our art called Balintawak. Uh, so there's a lot of history in that, that book as well. Um, and it's called Balintawak by Sam Buat. So I'm reading that right now, um, just in honor of, we call him Manong Sam. He hated to be called, be called a, a grandmaster, but um, when you ask about the tattoos and, and the martial arts, to me, they give each other power. So um, I'm a member of a tribe called the Mark of Four Waves or Tatak ng Apat ng Alon. And what we've done is revived the traditional warrior Filipino tattoos. I know tattoos are a, a, a kind of a fad with young Filipinos and they're just getting these Polynesian designs without understanding that in our own culture, we have very sacred designs. And the tattoo designs, um, it's not generic. That there are, are multiple tribes, indigenous tribes in the Philippines, and each tribe has its own patterns. So that's how the tribes knew which tribe was their enemy, enemy tribe, which tribe were their, their friendly tribes. Um, they were like um, uniforms in a, in a football team, right? So my, my tattoos are, are if, Ifugao tattoos. So if you see these, it's, it's the patterns are very, are very specific and very distinct amongst the Ifugao people compared to the Kalingas, compared to the Bontoks, compared to the Ibaloi. So it's very, very, very nice, very nice. So it's very, very distinct. Um, and only the warriors were allowed to get tattoos. So the more heads you, you took, or the more battles you fought, the more tattoos you were allowed to get. And because I'm not allowed to take heads literally um, here in the United States, <laughs> I just took a bunch of heads today. So we take heads to impart knowledge. So mm. um, that's how I earn my tattoos. And, and, and the Filipino martial arts, you know, the, that is just one aspect of being a warrior, um, the fighting arts. And the fighting arts are really protecting your community, protecting your family, protecting your tribe, but also protecting traditions and protecting your history. <laughs> So the warrior wasn't just somebody who fought, but they were also a provider. They were fishermen, they were, they were hunters, they were um, farmers, they were artisans, um, they were leaders, they were historians. So when I talk about being a warrior, it's all encompassing. And the, the tattoos are just a way for me to um, display what I know spiritually, show them externally, and also honor my Ifugao roots, my ancestors. So every Every mark on my body has a specific meaning. And so for us who, who um, are members of the tribe, we believe that you have to do your research into your tribe, your ancestral tribe, and you have to earn your tattoos. Um, some of your old buddies from, from Seattle are members of the tribe. Um, Larry Alcantara and, um, is a member of the tribe. Um, so, you know, there were, were all ages from the old guys like, like Larry to some of the young, you, you know, young 20 year olds. But it's something that I think is important um, in my development as a Filipino American. When I went to college, I felt that the only thing I ne needed to know about my Filipino American identity was my Filipino American history. But it wasn't until I went to college or, or grad school when I was challenged by a professor to um, write a, a paper on what is an authentic Filipino that I really started delving into my indigenous roots and started with understanding our mythology, our creation myths, and then who are the people that, that, that wrote these or, or shared these tales and, and where do they come from and what were their values and their traditions and, and their rituals. And that's, that also, I feel, made me even a, um, a deeper and richer Filipino 
in addition to my Filipino, my knowledge of Filipino American history. So it's the Filipino martial arts and I'm a master in, in Balintawak and I am a, a ranking member of our tattoo tribe. So to me, it's all interrelated into who I am as a Filipino American. Wow. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mel. Let's give Mel another big round of applause. That was amazing. You have a, a lot of questions here on the chat. I'm not gonna, uh, well, I could always, you know, the, the tattoo priest, I do a, a tattoo presentation. Maybe that could be something else. Or another yeah, time. absolutely. Uh, uh, Mel has I'll take off all my clothes. <laughs> yep. Lots of questions on here. So we're going to um, kind of uh, give it to Alan. Yeah. I know Claire Miranda was here on our chat earlier. She might still be here, but um, she is um, doing this, uh, the film called Dreamland. And Alan, I believe, wanted to show that to wrap up today's um, uh, presentation. Go ahead, Alan. We are headed to an old Presbyterian church and it was built probably in the early 1900s when Filipinos came into the Yakima Valley they needed a place to stay well, at least they stayed soon. on close to the yeah. hop fields or in this case they were allowed to stay in the church and so about two years ago we came out to the structure and inside of it those uh, monongs who came in the 30s they it seems like they wanted to be remembered we're headed to um, east uh, yakima a place called um, moxie Mischief, Cherie. <laughs> yeah. Cherie, her family, they were French. And a lot of the French people were here in the valley. She was saying, you know, that the, her family used to, you know, mingle with my mom and dad. Some of the families there also hid some of the Filipinos, you know, when they were being uh, attacked or, you know, uh, prejudice was uh, very blatant then. It's very dark there and it's when it's hot you can't believe how hot it is upstairs for those people, your people, to be living up there. And up there are, he drove to um, pictures on the wall of his sweetheart and he signed his name and he put dates down there and they're all up there and they're getting now to the point where they should be restored because of their fading away and it is a mess and nobody goes out there and you're going to have to pick your way and i am sorry but you want to see it so come on <laughs> some old potato bags and uh, and everything over here, Manang. I need to 
tablet. <laughs> Nothing in it. Wait, wait, wait. There are nail uh, holes um, on the, on the wood, on the wood, and then there are, and I feel some nails here. Well, it, it was probably um, maybe there were small packs. No, it's because it was maybe it was all this. Was, maybe there was a cover yeah. to it. Maybe some uh, plywood panels. This must have been the, the, more or less the heater ray. Oh, really? Because, oh, yeah. it, you know, see there's a layer. Maybe this is what kept them. Although they just lived here during the summer, I wonder. Not the winter. Used to have stuff on it. Yeah, there's some more here. It's faded already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's in my camera. Because it came out before. Yeah. I'll have to check it out to see. As I said, nobody comes here. Address. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see where it is, the name, and... Here are some of the walls have already caved in. They've fallen apart. Nice. Alan, you're on. So, um, I don't know if Claire is still on the Zoom, but um, Claire, if you're still around, maybe. Make sure you're not muted on the screen as well. You're not muted. You're fine. Yeah. There's Claire. <laughs> I heard it. Okay. Oh, my dog. Uh, that concludes tonight's program. Uh, we have a. Uh, this is actually our second of seven that we're going to be doing this month. Hopefully you guys that. chime on in. And Claire, there you are. We thought you were gone and, and sleeping, but I guess this is morning for you. You want to say a couple of words there, Claire, before we sign off? Uh, thanks again for uh, the wonderful talk, um, Mel. Uh, it's always really great to see uh, like the, <laughs> the stories from a different lens um, amidst like embedded in the great grand story of Filipinos in America. So thank, thank you for you. that. Thank you. Oh, okay. Ray? So um, let's give Mel Orpelia another big round of applause. Thank you so much, Mel. Got a lot of questions here. And also, Claire, thank you so much for uh, allowing us to show your trailer. Um, the chat's pretty live today. There's a lot of things happening, a lot of people sharing, which is really great. I suggest you guys scroll through the chat and check out the links and also some of the resources as right well. Also, our next Bonds uh, Now event is going to be October 12th. 
which is going to highlight uh, Filipino American literature with Peter Bacho and Virginia's poet laureate uh, Louisa Gloria, who is a professor at Old Dominion University. Thank you guys so much. This was great. I got to take off, but you guys can stay here. I got to do my lesson plans for tomorrow. <laughs> you guys are welcome to stay. I still got to teach tomorrow. I got to do my plans. So you guys are welcome to hang out. I'll see you guys later. Bye.